also in terms of data, data without analytics is just a waste of time and money. So. After reading the first draft of our undergraduate thesis, our advisor said we didn't need to be so staid with the title, so we changed it to Where's Wally Investing Now?, which in hindsight was probably pushing a little too far in the opposite direction. But it was about investing in emerging markets, something I've always been interested in. So in 2010, when I was living in Copenhagen and working as a consultant in the Nordic region, I jumped at the chance to pick up on a one-week project with our Moscow office lying out on a Friday evening to give myself a little sightseeing time. The twist was, I needed to apply for my visa by the end of the next day in order to get it processed in time, and to do that, I needed a hotel confirmation. My colleagues were all staying centrally, but I didn't have time to get the corporate wheels turning, so I had to make my own booking, and the only hotel replying at that hour was on the edge of Moscow's outer ring road. To get to Red Square on the Saturday morning then, I needed to take the number 7 metro line in. This could have been tricky, given my lack of Cyrillic comprehension, but the station next to mine had a number in its name. So while this is a story about getting lost in translation, it's thankfully not a story about getting lost. Instead, what happened is that at every station along the way, more and more military personnel boarded the train. I tried to remain open-minded, but when I surfaced and found the streets filling with banner-waving crowds, I figured this might not be the best day to be strolling around with an ice cream in hand. But I still wanted to see St. Basil's and the like. So I spent my Saturday doing the most circuitous walk of the city imaginable, taking the long way around every crowd or clump of soldiers I came across. And that plan worked, in a way. I got back to my hotel that night tired, but happy to have ticked off all the big sights. And when I did so, I flopped onto my bed and turned the TV to CNN, the one English channel on the menu only to find out that the soldiers hadn't been there to control the crowds. The crowds had been there to see the soldiers. It was a parade of thousands of Russian soldiers, military cadets and veterans who gather every year to mark the anniversary of the parade when Soviet soldiers marched out to meet the Nazis. And I feel like Bill Clinton had been there as a special guest of honour, though my recent googling fails to confirm this. In any case, I just spent my entire day actively avoiding one of the biggest draw cuts of the year. All of which is a long way of saying that, if you're like me, you may have an unnuanced view of the Russian market. I wanted to correct that. Welcome to How to Lend Money to Strangers with Brendan LaGrange. So my name is Igor Prokopenko. I'm a sales director at Experian Russia and CIS. So basically, it's ex-Soviet republics. And uh, thank you for uh, this invitation and the opportunity to speak about the landing landscape in Russia. So I'm uh, more than 10 years with experience and I've been through a variety of different roles, uh, starting as a solution uh, analyst for implementation, product consultant, uh, wider sales management role. So experience in Russia is uh, for about 20 years and so we actually entered this market at the very beginning of uh, the development of the uh, lending here. So actually, I was observer and uh, to some extent active participant of these market developments. I will try to share some interesting insights. So in regards to our business uh, in Russia, so we focus on the financial sector for different banks and micro lending organizations. So roughly speaking, it's quite close to 100 million credit histories. And the total Russian population is about 140 million. So most of uh, the eligible population is covered. So our portfolio covers full cycle of retail lending. So starting from onboarding coordinations and going through customer management and collections also covering fraud prevention area. We have uh, additional services related to data analytics, uh, data modeling, etc. We have a joint venture in the credit bureau space in Russia. This is a United Credit Bureau. 
We have a share of that together with Bearbank, so the top one bank in Russia, and Interfax uh, Information and uh, Business Data Company. And the bureau environment there, is it a full comprehensive credit bureau or negative only data? Thanks to uh, legislation here. So uh, from the beginning of the credit bureau was established in the form of both uh, negative and positive data. And from my perspective, it supported a lot the rapid growth of uh, this market. So it's also a competitive market. So there are three main credit bureaus that compete for the quality of the service. The United Credit Bureau being a bit little here, but yeah, basically it's quite competitive. This Russian market overview is actually a episode I was looking forward to from the time I started the show. It's a market that I briefly got to work in and have kept an interest in. But from an outsider's point of view, we don't really have a good understanding, I don't think, of of what's happening there. And there was a time early in my career when several big international banks tried to make inroads into the Russian market and then uh, had to withdraw It's a market with a lot of skills and technology behind it. And I had an episode earlier when I spoke to Joffrey in Georgia, and he talked about the expansion of Russian banks into Georgia. And these are just names that are very unfamiliar to to the rest of us. I think I know Tinkoff because I, I like to follow professional cycling. But could you maybe start by giving us all a little bit of a background, some high-level context of what the consumer credit landscape is in Russia? What what does lending look like? Yeah, sure. So great question. I will give market a view in um, several dimensions. First is size, history and structure. So starting with the specifics about the Russian financial sector, there's quite large number of financial institutions that have a license uh, to do the banking business. So currently it's about 150 organizations. It was a um, quite long-going program from a regulator to consolidate the business and clean up to let stay only uh, healthy businesses. So if we could say take a five-year uh, look in the back, it was almost double uh, this number. So about the history, actually, the Russian retail lending is uh, uh, relatively young. So it uh, started less than 20 years ago. And it made a huge jump from very, very basic stuff that was like 15 years ago to the state that we have now. There's a positive outcome of this short history. We don't have much uh, legacy technologies, uh, etc., that some of a large international group experience. Uh, take uh, like core uh, banking systems. They don't have something that was developed uh, 50 years ago. They're more or less more than state. So in terms of the structure, I would say we have three or four types of the players in the market. So first, uh, we have a um, number of uh, large banks with uh, direct or indirect government uh, shared. Second uh, segment is a well, large privately owned banks. Some of them are universal banks. Some of them are focusing on a retail part of the business only. And Tinkoff is one example for it. And uh, thirdly, still we have a few international groups uh, presented here with quite a stable business. So I can name uh, Unicredit, Raiffeisen, Citibank is also doing business here. So some of them that did it in the right way and more importantly, the right time. So they find their niche, their clients, their segment, and uh, most of them uh, continue to invest and uh, develop the business. And uh, another aspect that I would like to add that we have quite large number of microfinance organizations that uh, actually takes quite significant market share as well. So say each fifth unsecured loan goes to microfinance organization. Microfinance organizations are mainly providing say, loans for the private individuals, not for micro businesses, probably due to the size of the gray economy. And uh, many people uh, can't actually uh, take the loan from the banks uh, because they can't prove their income, etc., etc. Thanks for that overview. You mentioned how Russian lenders are typically unencumbered by the oldest legacy systems. 
Since the development of these legacy systems is inherently linked to the development of the products they support and can support, I suppose it's also possible that Russian lenders have an altogether different product suite. Is this the case? Or would the product landscape be relatively familiar to a Western lender with credit cards, personal loans, mortgages and the like? Well, uh, product-wise, it's the same as you mentioned. So the, the most, uh, let's say, popular one in terms of volume and value is the unsecured cash loans. Uh, the second, I mean, is credit cards. Just to give you some idea numbers, it's roughly 80% share of unsecured loans is a cash loans, 20 is for credit cards. Mortgage is developing more rapidly. Currently in Rubble Valley, it's almost a similar size as unsecured loans and after loans being about 10%. So to some extent, it is uh, quite similar uh, that you can have in some other markets. Probably we have a bit less credit cards, a bit less mortgages uh, due to current state of social and uh, economics development in Russia. So I was just reading up a few articles before the call And the numbers I looked at were all pre-COVID, but showed pretty strong growth in consumer credit and a bit of debate about whether it was too fast or not. And then obviously COVID hit, which would have shaken up everything. Um, In terms of growth, what was the market looking like? And maybe uh, if we can also talk a bit about COVID, how that's perhaps changed people's outlook on risk and maybe outlook on product? In terms of growth, currently it's in the stage of rapidly growing and accelerating post-pandemic. So for this year, this expected the growth rate of 25%, similar in higher growth rate as it was in 2018, 2019. Versus 2020, so the most the most dangerous from a pandemic perspective, the growth converted into flat. So pandemic definitely affected uh, profitability of the retail business. And uh, mostly it was related to significantly increased provisions. Secondly, the restructure, many of the uh, borrowers, they ask for it uh, in mortgages and unsecured loans, respectively. Currently, profitability is back to, to the positive and uh, Primary driver for it, first, I mean, just growth in, in, in volumes. And uh, second is a significant decrease of the provisions made last year. Currently, cost of risk is reducing, and for the retail lending, it's uh, roughly about 2%, so quite uh, low historical rates. You're listening to How to Lend Money to Strangers with Brendan LaGrange. If you're enjoying it, Now is a great time to hit that little plus button to subscribe. Other follow button formats are also available. Let's get back to the show. In terms of indebtedness, it is uh, uh, relatively high and uh, it is a concern for for the regulator with a high risk or with a high PTI uh, loans and uh, they put in uh, rules in place and policies that uh, requires banks to have more provisions kind of indirect uh, limitation to slow down the, the growth a bit. In terms of the products, we might expect uh, some slowdown in mortgages due to cutting down this uh, government program of supporting and uh, subsidizing uh, interest rate. And inflation rate is going up quite similar to many other countries. So the interest rates are getting higher and higher and is uh, becoming less affordable uh, for for population to get the mortgage. So for instance, the property price in Moscow raised about 30% just over one year. And uh, partially it was the outcome of this uh, government program because it allowed more and more customers uh, to get mortgages and uh, the demand increased dramatically. Immediately, the market reacted. It was one of the factors. Construction material <laughs> also were raising uh, across, across the globe. Igor, you mentioned the relative youth of the Russian lending market. So I suppose that means for many years, lenders would have been able to grow without too much concern about overlending. 
but you also mentioned that that is no longer the case. So as lenders now look to regain growth momentum post-pandemic, touch wood we are still post-pandemic despite the new COVID strains, but yeah, as lenders now look to grow post-pandemic, but also post a two-decade lending boom, where are they looking for that growth? From the same customers or new customer segments, or they're exploring new niches, maybe even going into that gray economy? Well, I would say mixed actions uh, in the market to address overall, let's say, in-depthness. So if you look from top players, they're now focusing on uh, the customer management uh, aspect, trying to surf with uh, relevant and uh, timely upsells, cross-sells, or additional products uh, to be offered to their clients and customers and uh, basically finding uh, the new profitable niche through the existing clients. Some of the banks that have quite uh, a large portion of the payroll uh, clients or uh, have, uh, let's say, some insurance data from uh, the group. So they're trying to convert uh, these clients into uh, the credit clients. While the players trying to find uh, other niche and uh, some of them go through like digital, trying to find some alternatives and data sources to have some kinds of pre-approved offer to be delivered to uh, different channels. In terms of going to a gray zone economy, I believe it's uh, quite well limited by the regulator. And this is the reason then uh, the microfinance organization are uh, that popular in Russia because yeah, microfinance are less regulated and you they can do something uh, disruptive and still be in a, a bank with a, with a license. But microfinance are less regulated and uh, they are typically more disruptive. I believe this by now been later in Russia is uh, quite well behind uh, the Europe, but I would expect significant growth here. Uh, this related to a rapid development of the e-commerce space in Russia. And it is great an opportunity to grab this space and then enter it. Speaking of disruption and disruptors, how and where are the fintechs, the challengers, the innovators in general changing the Russian market? One of the recent examples of entering the market is Yandex, kind of Russian Google. So huge tech company with a a service and products line quite similar to Google. So they just recently acquired a small bank and launched the Index Bank. So they're trying to build the synergy between the data they obviously have from like internet searches, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and build, uh, let's say, uh, some interesting product on top of it. So just very, very recent story, uh, probably a couple of months. Also, we don't have... Uh, clear visibility of the product direction, etc. And we'll be uh, keeping an eye on it. So it sounds a bit like the Chinese model where Alibaba and Tencent came in and used their data from the other businesses, from their search engines, all of that that they sort of combined and used to score consumers. Yeah, absolutely. Quite similar story. And while other top players on the market they are trying to expand and uh, diversify their business to non-financial revenue. And uh, Sberbank is probably uh, the largest example of it. If you look at Sberbank 10 years ago, it was just a financial group and that's it. And uh, if we look now, there are lots of different uh, services for the you know, private individuals they offer. So they expanded it to uh, traditional apps like form of super apps that incorporates uh, different lifestyle application, taxi app, some kind of local equivalent of Netflix, like food um, delivery, car subscription, so uh, ecosystem. And you can have an additional uh, uplift interest rate for the deposit. You have a discount uh, to buy a movie, etc., etc. And they're trying to track as much time of their consumers as possible on the other hand, to promote the services. Yeah, I think that's interesting coming from the banking side because we've looked at the Chinese super apps, but they came from 
the super app background and added financial services to it. Because normally, why would anybody care about their bank? So yeah, to hear that a bank is doing this and able to attract people to the ecosystem, keep them there with these partner offers, is good news and something that many lenders around the world might have a little look at because that's where uh, the traffic's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the most rapid growth doesn't lie in the financial service and products only. And for this reason, uh, I mean, top players are trying to build up a tech company on top of the like financial institution because uh, retail lending is uh, quite poor hit at the moment. So you can't just double your retail business by finding some new population. So going from film to tech, well, most commonly we see tech companies are just bringing some financial products, but say from cash available for the investment, uh, financial is probably uh, in a preferred position. And due to some geopolitical reasons, they're not going uh, to other countries in Europe to expand and scale there. So I would rather expect going to the East, to the Asia, in the developing countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, etc. And uh, having quite solid digital business model, it uh, can be done uh, relatively quick. They test and learn and they have quite a uh, large appetite for risk. They quite quickly can enter one market, say for a couple of months, see the current state of it. And if it's profitable, they stay. If not, they close and open in uh, the nearest market. If we look at the other big trends, what would you say are there two or three in Russia right now? I would definitely mention open banking. It's not yet in Russia. We see the, some short steps to establish it, and uh, it could be a game changer, and it could uh, potentially change the structure of the current market because definitely the large players enjoy uh, the variety of data they have, and that's why it is so difficult to campaign against. So being prepared for it and uh, taking the advantage uh, at the early days can uh, significantly change the market. Second uh, is alternative data sources. This is quite a common topic across different markets. The uh, telecoms sell some kind of scoring or risk indexes, but still uh, there are more and more potential data that can uh, help uh, for better risk assessment. There is also privacy, yeah. So we don't have a GDPR, but we have some personal data protection, etc. So there is always a balance. I also see a continuous trend on on the digital. Of, of course, it was really boosted uh, with the pandemic, but it's still uh, some uh, say barriers if bank would need to onboard a new customer for them. And let's say remote authorization and uh, and all the checks, it's not yet fully in place from technology perspective and uh, legislation-wise. And uh, consumers, I expect everything to be uh, digital and uh, frictionless. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much. It's been really enlightening to, to have you on. You've also nicely set up next week's episode because I'm speaking to your experienced colleagues about data expansion at the Credit Bureau, looking at open banking in the UK, your boost model, and incorporating alternative data into scorecards in Indonesia. But yeah, Igor, thank you so much for your time. And thank you all for listening. And indeed for your wonderful reviews. Please do keep those coming in. And if you haven't done so already, like, share, and subscribe to the show. How to Lend Money to Strangers is written, hosted, and edited by myself, Brendan LaGrange, and recorded outside the actually not that rainy city of Maidstone, England. The theme tune and show music is by I Am Wake, and you can find show notes, written transcripts, more in-depth articles, and details on how to book me for speaking engagements at www.howtolendmoneytostrangers.show. I'll see you again next Thursday.
me again. Just in case you've had your full of lending talk, did you know that I've also published two pulpy action adventure thrillers? Draken and Butterfly Hill are both available as ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks from Amazon and other online retailers. They're not Shakespeare, but they're not expensive either. And Ford Clarion Reviews compared Draken to Clive Kessler turning Raiders of the Last Ark into a shoot 'em up. Full disclosure, that was in a three star review, so I'm not sure it was meant to be a compliment, but I think you get the picture.